All right, welcome to chapter six, section five, called Isosceles and Equilateral Triangles. Uh, so this is for IM2 or Integrated Math 2. A uh, couple of things you'll see on the front screen here is a due date. I don't see that on the teacher preview, but you'll see it on your student side. The second thing is the number of attempts. Remember, we always have unlimited attempts for all of our assignments, tests, and quizzes. The number of questions just tells you how many questions are on this particular assignment. Uh, grading policy is always best score. So whichever attempt is the best one is the one you keep. Partial credit is enabled, meaning if you answer one of five questions correctly, you get credit for one question or however many questions you answered correctly. Um, please remember once you start your homework, you must finish um, before you can work on anything else. And what that means is once I click start, down in the bottom right corner here, I will see submit assignment button. Um, and before I move away from this screen, I need to click the submit assignment button. Whether or not I've started anything, or if I've started some, you know, maybe one or two or all of them, um, I want to click that button. Number one, it stops the system from locking me out, just like that, that first screen said. So it's going to assume I want to leave this attempt open if I don't click submit assignment. Um, remember, you have unlimited attempts, so it doesn't matter how many times you come back in and try this. It's also going to save your place. As long as you have a green check mark up here, you will start wherever it is you left off. You don't have to go back and redo anything. Um, the second big thing that it does is it actually affects the grade book so your teacher can see what you've been working on. Before you click submit assignment, your um, account's kind of frozen um, or paused on that assignment so we can't see what you've been working on. So just good habit, always click that button. Um, on the side here you have explanation, example, and message. Um, so explanation tells you you're going to lose your question attempt because it's literally going to give you the answer to this question. So it's not going to give you the answer and then let you come type in the answer. Sorry, that's not how that works. Um, you'll have to come in on another attempt to try that one out. Um, example, we'll show you an example of something similar to what we're looking at here. Um, and then it will walk you through, you know, this is how you fill out a, a two column proof. Um, and then you can... Oh, I'm going to scooch this over. Sorry, using the wrong mouse here. Um, I can close that. I can open another example if I'd like to see another one. And I can also message my teacher directly from the screen. Um, it attaches a picture of this question so that we know kind of where to help you or where to start trying to help you. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and get started on this one. So we've been working with proofs now. I want to say this is like the third um, section that we've been doing proofs pretty heavily in. Um, so remember proofs when we have our two columns, it's not always just about how do I get from, you know, A to B as far as solving or getting through a problem, but why can I take every single step that I've taken? So I need to be able to explain myself. Um, it's definitely a very um, new skill or kind of different type of skill than most math um, concepts because we're not always used to stopping and thinking about, well, why can I add these two together? Or, you know, when we're solving an equation, why can I move one number from one side of the equation to the other side of the equation? Things like that. So it's just, it's a different skill set where we're slowing down and we're explaining ourselves. How do I know where to go or what I'm doing? Um, it's, it, it takes a little bit of time to get used to, um, but let's see. So one big thing, Whenever you have a proof or really anything to do with geometry and you get a diagram, the first thing you should do is draw the diagram. Have it on your paper so that you can mark it up. Makes it way easier to follow along if you can actually put markings on the, the diagram. Um, and as you can see, I just kind of stole a screenshot of mine and put it on my little Sketchpad app, but we might not always have that option to do something like that. Um, if you're looking at this on a computer, sometimes you can get like the, the drawing apps that actually draw on the, the um, internet screen. For some reason, my drawing app doesn't work on this screen. I have to use this other one. Um, but, you know, there's all kinds of things we can do with different apps that help us. But, you know, paper, pencil, that's also very simple. Um, all right. So when we're going through and doing this, everything that we're doing on a proof we have to put every piece of information and if it's not stated as a statement and a reason, it doesn't exist. So even the given information here, this has to be put in the, the proof here as a statement and a reason. And the reason simply that you're putting it in there is it was given to me. But if you don't state it, then it doesn't exist yet. You can't use it. Um, 
Remember too, and I keep using this analogy over and over and over again, when we go through a proof, it's a little bit like getting dressed in the morning. There's more than one way to get dressed, but some things have to happen before others. So if I'm thinking of say my socks and my shirt, I can put my socks on or I could put my shirt on first. It's not gonna bother either one. Neither one of those steps are dependent on each other. But if I'm talking about my shoes, my shoes are dependent on my socks. I have to have the socks on first before I put the shoes on. Um, or if I'm talking about a jacket, I'd probably need to put my shirt on before I put the jacket on, right? So those are dependent steps. It doesn't matter if I put the shirt or the socks on first, but I need to put you know those on before I can do my jacket and my shoes. So it just depends on you know the route you take, but there's always more than one way to go about these problems. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at what we see here. Um, and we've been working a whole lot with um, triangles in the last couple of sections and looking at how to prove triangles congruent. So we have side angle side, angle side angle, angle angle side, or um, side side side. Those were the, the four that we've had so far. These are properties. So as soon as I can prove that two sides of one triangle are congruent um, to two sides of another triangle and their included side are congruent, or sorry, included angle are congruent, the triangles are congruent. Now here's two angles in the included side, um, two angles right in a row with the next side, so kind of consecutive, um, and then all three sides are congruent. If that doesn't sound familiar, go back and watch the last couple of section videos because we go over those pretty heavily um, in sections three and four. Um, so I'm just kind of glossing over them a little bit right now because um, we've already spent a lot of time going through these properties. Um, so we're going to use probably one of these properties. There are other ones, but we're most, most likely going to use one of these four because these are the four that we've been introduced to so far. This is also called isosceles and equilateral triangles. So we're probably going to do something that has to do with isosceles or equilateral. So isosceles, an isosceles triangle, isosceles um, triangle means that we have a triangle with two legs that are congruent like this. So this is an isosceles triangle. Um, and I'm gonna draw this a little bit bigger because if I have an isosceles triangle, then the opposite angles are congruent like this. I can go opposite. If I know that the sides are congruent, then the angles opposite those sides are congruent. Um, I can also start with congruent side or congruent angles like this and say, okay, well, if I have the two base angles congruent, then the sides opposite are congruent. And this is the converse of the isosceles triangle theorem, which means it's just kind of backwards. That's what converse means. So we have two theorems that go with isosceles triangle. We also have an equilateral triangle. So equilateral, equilateral, equal, what am I forgetting? I forgot the A, equilateral. So equilateral triangle, if I have a triangle that looks something like this, that means that equa means the same, lateral means sides, so it means that I have three congruent sides. If we're thinking about that isosceles triangle theorem, we can kind of take it a step further and say, well, then all this, the angles are gonna be congruent to each other. So equilateral triangles are also equiangular triangles, meaning that all of the angles are equal to each other. So whether I start with equilateral or equiangular, doesn't matter which one I start with, both are true. Um, so that's just kind of a quick definition of those two pieces. Um, and I know if, you're, if you have your notes pages, which you should have your notes pages open with you while you're watching these videos, um, then there are some diagrams that show you isosceles triangle and equilateral triangles. Um, it looks like I have isosceles. I don't think, maybe I don't do equilateral. Let's see. I might be fibbing about the equilateral. It's labeled that way, but I don't know if we actually use that definition at all. I think we focus mainly on isosceles here. Yeah, so it looks like we focus very heavily on the isosceles part of this um, topic. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and look at the given information here. Actually, look at this diagram. 
So we have RV, which is this little piece here, is congruent to TU, which is this little guy over here, boop, like that. And then we have angle R is congruent to angle T. So this was given information. I don't have to do anything for that information, it's just given to me, but I do have to make sure, and I can just click send a proof, and it just sends it with the, the reason given. I can also type it in here if I want to, but then I have to click on the reason and click given at the top. So just make sure, you know, whichever way you're doing that, you're identifying why am I putting this in the proof. And even if it's given to me, I have to put it in the proof, because otherwise it doesn't exist yet. Um, all right, so now that we have our given in the, the statements and reasons here, we can go through and start thinking about how do I prove these two triangles congruent. And let's highlight these different colors really quick so that it makes it a little easier to think about it. So I have RS and U like that. So RS, U, and then I also have, and I'll do that one in pink, um, TS, V. So they're kind of overlapping triangles a little bit there. They're not overlapping like the way we've had them before, which is kind of nice when they're, um, something is shared. There's nothing fully shared here. So I have a little bit of yellow and a little bit of pink here in between. Um, they share parts of angle S, but not even the whole thing. So um, we have bits and pieces that are shared there. Um, so we need to figure out how do I prove the yellow triangle congruent to the pink triangle. Um, and we need to use one of these pieces here. So one thing we can take a look at, um, and this is going to be called segment addition. If I look at this piece here, well, I already know that the blue section is congruent if I look at this piece here. So, and I'm even going to put these in blue again. So I have this piece is blue and this piece is blue, right? Just taking it from here. And they're congruent to each other. So I already know I have a section of this line that's congruent. What's left over in the middle here is shared. So we are going to use a shared section here. They do both share VU. And I know VU is congruent to itself. We don't necessarily need to state VU is congruent to VU because we're not, that's not a full side. But what we are going to need to use is the fact that um, RV plus VU equals RU, the entire segment. And I'm just going from here to here. And then we're also going to do the same thing on the other side here. TU plus T, or sorry, UV is going to equal TV. We're going to have to do some subtraction there, some substitution to show how they're equal to each other. Because what we're trying to get down is just to VU, that these equal each other. Um, and the two sides specifically equal each other, the whole side. So I can kind of see that, that they share each other a little bit there. And we're going to have to use some segment addition here, kind of going segment addition and substitution just a little bit. Um, so that'll give us a whole side congruent. Um, and then, let's see, we're going to have to use, we already have angle. So we have, we'll have a side and angle. Once we prove this, this side is congruent to this side. We have angle and angle. Well, we just learned about isosceles triangles. And so if I'm thinking of this entire triangle, and I'm going to put this here just for a second, then I'm going to erase it because I don't want to get too crazy with the colors. But we have this entire big triangle. And if I'm thinking about the entire triangle there, I have these two base angles. I know they're on the left side, but we're going to kind of look at it sideways. I can go across the entire thing here. I'll turn the line tool off. I can go across the entire thing here. So that would mean that ST is going to be congruent to SR. And I'll put two marks on here. So now I would have side, angle, side. So I, I know what my plan of attack is going to be. Um, and I know that's not, it's kind of scribbly. It's got a lot of stuff going on there. Um, but before we start jumping into the proof and the statements and the reasons, we want to kind of look at the diagram and play around with it. What can I even do with this diagram based on the given information? How do I get from this information to this proof? 
Um, so we kind of want to go through and play with it. What do I know about this? What was I just introduced to? Because more than likely that's what we're going to be using too. Um, so it's just one of those pieces. It, it can be a little difficult to jump around and, and um, kind of conceptualize well, how do I move from piece to piece. But we just have to um, keep in mind everything we've learned up to this point and what we're learning right now. Um, geometry is very much so a cumulative class where it's, it keeps building. Um, and the, the list of reasons, which we, we have a very, oops, I didn't mean to click on one. We have a very long list of reasons. And we have to keep all of these in our mind as we're going through. None of these go away as we move forward. Um, so that's not going to be the right reason there. Um, let's see, can I undo that guy? Yeah, okay. All right, so the first thing, let's focus in on this line over here, this kind of scribbling that we did. So I'm going to show this section. So RT plus um, VU equals RU like that. So again, I'm just focusing on the first piece here. So I'm focusing on this segment here. RV plus VU equals RU, the whole thing. Segment addition. So I am using segment addition property. So I want to go down and choose segment addition property. I'll validate that. All right. So now I'm going to focus on the pink triangle here. I'm going to go TU plus, so TU plus UV is going to equal TV, the whole thing. So let's go back. I'm trying to get rid of some of these scribbles here. So TU plus UT equals TV. I just did that wrong. This should be a V. There we go. And again, segment addition. I'm just adding those segments together. So now, wait, where'd it go? Darn it, did I pass it? I did. So now we have our two segments added together. Um, and now what I want to do is show that VU is equal to TV. We already know that these two sections are equal. We're really just proving that this section in the middle is the same. It's shared. Um, so now I'm going to use part of my given information here and I'm going to substitute information in. So I'm going to say instead of RV for this first one, I'm going to replace it with TU. So I'm going to say TU instead of R RV, I'm replacing these two. And then instead of VU, or sorry, instead of, um, what do I want to do there? Um, let me see. I might be fibbing. Are you TV? Nope. Okay. VU. That's, I still wanted to leave it the same. So I just wanted to replace these two because if you notice these two are the same, they're just backwards. VU and UV. It's the same exact thing, which we already noticed. They share the, the middle. So I was just getting myself funky there because they were backwards for a minute. But it's not a big deal if they're backwards or not. So this is going to equal RU. Well, if we notice now it's TU, TU, UV and VU, doesn't matter. They're backwards, but they mean the same thing. Equals TV and U, RU. So this, I'm using substitution here. I'm substituting. Instead of writing RV, I know, sorry, um, RV, I know RV equals TU. I'm going back to that step one, that given information, and saying, okay, well, I'm going to substitute one thing for, for something I know to be equal to it. So I'm going to go ahead and click check, or validate, sorry. So that, that was good. They liked that idea. So now, instead of writing TU plus UV, or VU, again, doesn't really matter with the direction there, I'm just going to go ahead and say, well, instead of this section, I'm just going to put TV, and that's going to equal RU. Um, and this one, depending on how you write this, this could actually be transitive or a substitution. Um, I could actually see it being either. Um, transitive is where we kind of, um, it looks like this, where we go like 
and I like to do it in this step looking thing where I go A equals B, B equals C, C equals D. So I kind of cancel these out and I jump from beginning to end and I say, okay, well then A equals D. And I could write that in this, this same way. Um, but because of the way we have it written where TV's at the end instead of the beginning, um, I think that they're looking going to look more a little bit for substitution or it looks a little bit more like substitution. Um, so we're actually using substitution twice in a row. Um, where'd it go? Did I already pass it? I did. So we're substituting again. So now I've, I just proved that these two are equal to each other. So the last piece I just have to show, because now I have side and angle, I need to do these, these sides out here for the isosceles triangle theorem. Um, so I have RS is equal to TS, and that's because of the isosceles triangle theorem. Um, it's actually going to be the converse of the because I'm going from angles to sides, so that's converse. Um, the the isosceles triangle theorem starts with sides and goes to angles. So if I'm starting with angles and going to sides, if I'm going backwards like that, it's the converse of the isosceles triangle. Uh, all right, so we have the the pieces here. So now I've stated everything I need to state, and I know this is kind of a longer one. I think this is one of the longest ones we've done so far with eight steps here. But now I have side, angle, side. And this one is side, angle, side, like that. So and remember the side is, is kind of the, the overlapping pieces there. So it becomes very messy there. But I can use side, angle, side to show that the yellow triangle is congruent to the pink triangle. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and send this to proof. And I'm going to go down and choose side, angle, side. I don't think there is another... Not necessarily that these couldn't be out of order. Um, they could definitely be in a different order for some of them. Because um, the, the, these segment additions could definitely be out of order. Um, or I could have even waited for this first one. I could have waited till you know, down here if I wanted to put it down here. Um, until before the substitution. I would have had to put it in before substituting um, TU for RV. Because I need to know that, that given information that RV is equal to TU. But I could have waited till down here. That could have been uh, closer to step five than it was step one. So again, they could have been out of order, but I don't necessarily think there was another way to do this one. We, we would have had to do it this way where we're using side angle side with the segment addition, um, isosceles triangle theorem, and a couple substitutions. So let's go ahead and validate, and my proof is done. So this is what you want to wait for before you click check. Now that my proof is done, I get the points for it. I'm all done. Um, but you have to go through each one of those steps to, before you get there. Okay, so we're going to go through and we're going to take a look at some um, isosceles triangle pieces here. Um, there we go. So just to have the diagram over here. And again, always, always, always get that diagram on your paper so that you can kind of mark it up there. You can um, oh, scoot over. So we can definitely see what's happening. Um, so this goes with the isosceles triangle theorem. Um, so we have 7 and 7. That means that they are congruent to each other. This is an isosceles triangle. So I know is that the base angles, the angles across, will be equal. And I know it's not directly across. That's not what it means. It's, it's kind of like the opposite angle. So S is going to be congruent to Q. Well, how does that help me? as far as I want to know what Q equals. Well, we also know that the angles of a triangle add up to 180. We worked with that for quite a few weeks. Um, so angle R plus angle S plus angle Q have to equal 180 degrees. And angle S and angle Q are the same thing. And angle um, R is 40 degrees. So I can go 40 degrees Plus, instead of S and Q, I'm just going to label them X. So I have X plus X equals 180. So now I can just solve for X. I have 40 plus 2X equals 180. I'm going to subtract 40 from both sides. Because I don't, I, I want to know, you know, what's left over for my two angles at the bottom here. So 2X equals 140. So that's all that's left over for these. And since they have to be equal, it makes sense that we're going to be dividing by 2. 
So we're going to divide by 2 and we're going to get 70 degrees. So both of these, it doesn't matter which one they would ask for, both of them would have to be 70 degrees. Because that's all that's left over. 70 plus 70 plus 40 is 180. All right. Um, we do have an equilateral triangle here. So um, we are using that just a little bit. Um, so an equilateral triangle also means equiangular. So if all of the angles, oh, that did not come out very nicely and straight there. All the angles are the same. What in the heck? Because I'm writing a little sideways on my board here. Like this, all the angles are the same. So they're all congruent to each other. I still have 180 degrees to deal with. And what I want to do is just divide it up evenly into three pieces. So 180 divided by three is 60 degrees. So whenever you have an equiangular triangle or an equilateral triangle, no matter what, no matter how large or small it is, all of your angles will be 60 degrees. Um, so that's just one of those little things. If you can remember that, then you don't have to do the calculation. But if you forget, equilateral, all the opposite angles will be the same. I have three of them. I have to divide it up into three equal pieces. All right. So let's see. We have... Um, so I think we kind of get to go around the do a few things here. Oh, where's my... There it is. All right. So um, now we have this triangle here, and they want us to find the value of x. Um, so we need to know a couple of different things here. So first of all, we know that these are equal. We have the little tick marks there, so we definitely want to pay attention to what do the markings mean. Um, we just learned about isosceles triangle theorem, so if I go to the opposite angles here, they're going to be equal to each other, so I can fill this guy in with 28 degrees. I also see this little corner mark here. Um, this means, this is a right angle mark is what it means when I see this little box. So this means 90 degrees. So now um, I can focus in on a piece. I don't have to fill this in at all. Um, I can ignore this piece here. I could fill it in if I wanted to. Um, so I could definitely fill this in and then fill this in and then fill this in. But there's really no reason to do all of those steps if I'm focusing in on the entire big triangle. So I'll put this guy in yellow. So we also have the, the entire triangle all the way around the outside. And the angles of that triangle have to add to 180 like any other triangle, all triangles. So even this kind of obtuse one here that has 28 and 28 and then something, that would have to add up to 180. The smaller one here, they add up to 180. And then the larger one also adds up to 180. Every single triangle does that same thing. So if I know they add up to 180 and I have x plus 28 and 28 and 90, I have three angles and I only have one variable. I can solve this. Um, one other thing to think about is if you have a right triangle, the other two angles have to add up to 90 degrees. Because remember, 180. 180 minus 90 is 90. So these two have to be complementary. That's what we call angles that add up to 90 degrees is they're complements of each other. Um, so we can write it out as, you know, x plus 28 plus 28 plus 90 equals 180, but we can also just focus in on these other two small angles and say x plus 28 plus 28 has to equal 90 um, because they're, they're the, the acute angles of a right triangle add up to 90 degrees. So it's a little one of those little tricks. Um, but, you know, I could show you why, too, if I went plus, whoops, plus 90 equals 180, like that. Basically, what we did is we just ignored the 90 really quick instead of combining it with like terms and said x plus 28 plus 28 equals 90. So this is exactly where it comes from. I'm basically saying, all right, I'm already using the 90. What's left over, I only have 90 left over. Um, if you were going to actually write it out like this, I'd probably just combine the like terms and then subtract once, but I just wanted to show you where it came from. 
So I have x plus, let's see, we get 16, so 56 and 90. I'm going to subtract 56 from both sides. So I get x equals, these guys cancel, so I'm going to borrow and I get 4 and 3, so 34 degrees for x. Uh-oh, I think it's freezing. Let's give it a second, but a lot of the time I end up having to reload it from this point. Hmm, well, darn it. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and reload it because I don't like waiting too long for this. So we're going to go back over here and scroll down. And preview. So it's going to take away a little bit of my progress there because it's a teacher preview. It would not take away your progress if, you know, this happened to you. It might take away the progress on that one problem, but it would not take away these other ones like it just did to me. Um, so we can see something very similar on problem three. It's just upside down, but very, very similar idea. We have isosceles triangle. You're going to bring that 30 over here. Um, and then you're going to start to solve these pieces. So this one would actually require you to fill in this one and then use the linear angle to fill in this piece to come over here um, to fill in these pieces down here um, because we don't have the 90 degrees. So this one's a little different because we don't have that 90 degrees to start off with. So you do have to use a little bit more workarounds on this one where you're filling in this triangle, then you can fill in this one, isosceles triangle theorem again, and then you can do the 180 here. So a little bit different, but still same idea. Um, all right, so we're going to go ahead and look at this one. Let's zoom in and okay. So now, scoot that back over just a little bit. Okay, so we have our angles here. We have some congruent marks. So this is an isosceles triangle meaning that at least two sides are congruent. So I can go opposite angles are also congruent to each other. Well, I know what this one is. So that means that this guy, this angle K, is going to be the exact same thing. It's going to be 4x plus 19. Or I could say times 2, you know, because I have two of them. So that's another way you could write it into your equations. So now it's asking me to find the measure angle for each one. Well, in order to know what the angle measure is for each one, I'm going to need to know what this variable is. I, I'm going to need to go solve for this variable and then plug it back in so that I can find each angle measure because they don't actually care what x equals, but I need to know what x is to find the measure angle for each one. So I have 2x plus 52 plus 4x plus 19 plus another 4x plus 19. And this is where I could have, instead of writing two of these, I could have gone like this times two, and then I wouldn't have had to do two of them, but then we would have had to distribute. So we would have ended up with the same thing anyway. All of these added together equal 180 degrees. Always, 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 it's a triangle. They're going to add it to 180 degrees. So now let's combine some like terms. We have four plus, I'm sorry, two plus four plus four. So that's eight, nine, 10. And then we have 52, 19, and 19. So let's see, we get 8, 9, it's 38. And then we get, if we add 38, we get 10, 5, 6, 9. So we get 90 equals 180. So I just combined all my like terms here, and that shortened it up quite a bit. So that definitely made it a lot smaller just by combining my like terms. So I'm going to subtract 90 from both sides and I get 10x, 90 minus 90 cancels, and I have 90 left over because 180 minus 90 is 90. Divide by 10 on both sides. So 10 divided by 10 is 1, 90 divided by 10 is 9. All right, 
So I know what x equals. Remember, this is not one of my answers. I'm not going to type 9 into any one of these. But I need to know what x is to come back over here and say, OK, well, angle L is going to be 2 times 9 plus 52. So, and they did give us a calculator on this one. So I'm going to go ahead and go 9 times, two, oops, 2 times 9, saying it backwards, plus 52. So just being a, not doing all that in my head. And then down here, I'd have 4 times 9 plus 19. So I have 4 times 9 plus 19. Oh, why isn't it typing? 4 times 9 plus 19 equals 55. This will also equal 55 because it's exactly the same. And I can come over here and test this out and say plus 55 plus 70. And so now I get the 180. So as long as that works out correctly, we're fine there. So now we just need to make sure. So K is 55. L, that was the 70. And M, that was also the 55. So it's just kind of going around, making sure that we're applying that isosceles triangle theorem correctly so that we know what all three angles are. And then if we have all three angles of a triangle, they add up to 180 degrees. So a lot of the time when we're doing triangles, that's one of the properties we're going to end up using. Um, all right, so we have use the given information to complete the proof. Um, let me grab a picture of this guy so I can draw on it. Okay. All right, so we're given this diagram here, and it says DE is congruent to DF. So DE, this side is congruent to DF. So I have an isosceles triangle. We're also given that DG, this dotted line, bisects angle EDF, EDF. So I'm going to have to define that word bisect. What does it actually mean for my diagram? So um, when it bisects something, and in this case it's bisecting an angle, it means it's cutting it in half. So if it's cutting it in half, it means that these two pieces will be the same. It's two equal pieces. That's what half means. So I know that's what that means. I'm not given this information, but I'm given the fact that it bisects, which means I can come to this information. I can arrive there. Um, so I have a side and an angle once I prove this. So this will be more than just two steps. I'm going to have to put it in the given, put in the given, define. Then I have side and angle. I'm trying to prove that this angle E is congruent to angle F. Um, so let's see. I don't think we actually get to use um, the isosceles triangle theorem because it's actually telling us that we're trying to prove that theorem. The angles opposite the two congruent sides of an isosceles triangle are congruent. So I don't think we actually get, I wonder if that's in the list. That would be interesting if it was in the list, wouldn't it? I don't see isosceles triangle theorem in the list. So they took it away because that's what we're trying to prove. Because um, I was going to say, really, right away I can just go, okay, they're opposites, you know, but I'm trying to prove why is this true. Um, so I'm going to go back and prove that the two triangles are congruent to each other. And the reason we care if the two triangles are congruent to each other is once the two halves of that triangle, the big triangle like these two pieces here, are congruent, corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So that's a big one. That helps us finish this problem. Because if I can show the corresponding parts are congruent, well, E is going to be corresponding to F if I'm looking at the halves of the triangle. And by halves, I mean... Let me actually highlight it. I'm going to say like this is kind of half the big triangle. And then we're also going to have the other part, which is this guy here. Like this. So if I can prove that the pink triangle is congruent to the yellow triangle, then once they're congruent, their corresponding parts are also congruent. Um, 
So it's one of those things we, we practice this quite a bit in section four. I believe we had two different proofs that went through and used um, corresponding parts of congruent triangles or congruent, which we shortened to be CPCTC. <laughs> um, so we don't have to write out all of that, those fun words there. Um, so I do see a shared side right here. So DG is shared um, between the pink and the yellow triangle. So that's going to be my third or my, my other side here. Um, once I state that those are, it's equal to itself using reflex property. Anything that's equal to itself, that's reflexive, right? We, we know that. DG is equal to DG. Um, so SAS, SAS. So that's side, angle, side. That's one of my properties that I can use to show triangles are congruent. So <clears throat> I kind of have my plan of attack here. I'm going to go ahead and start working on this guy. So I'm going to send a proof, send a proof. I don't want to send the proof yet because we're not there. That'll be at the very end. <coughs> and again, if this is like the idea of getting dressed, I can't do this. This is the very last thing I want to do in the, in the whole proof. Not proof, but in the proof. Um, so in these statements and reasons, I don't want to send this until the very last thing. That's, that's where I, I'm ending. Um, so now I'm going to define this word bisect, where we know it's, and I can't say angle D, because that could be the two smaller ones, that could be the larger one. So I need to go E, angle E, D, G, is congruent to angle F, D, G, F, D, G, like that. And the reason for that is I'm defining what this bisector is, and it's an angle bisector. So it's definition of angle bisector. There it is. Definition of angle bisector. Perfect. So now I've, I've got my side that was given. I just defined what angle bisector was, so I have my angle. Now I need to show that this shared side is shared. So I'm going to say segment DG is congruent to segment DG, so they're congruent to each other, that's reflexive. So now I have angle, side, angle. Sorry, I said that funny. Side, angle, side. Um, and I can go ahead and say that the triangles are congruent. So triangle EDG, so I just went, I, I'm actually using the same format as up here because I made sure they were in corresponding order, is congruent to triangle FDG. And it's because of side angle side. So I'm going to scroll down here and go side angle side. Validate. All right, I'm not done. This is my last step. Now I can say that angle E is congruent to angle F because corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. And E is corresponding to F. And I can even see that in this diagram. E and F are the same, are the first letters in my um, statement here. So that means they're corresponding. D corresponds to D, G corresponds to G. Um, so they're corresponding to each other in that order. So that's why the order matters so dang much. Um, so we're going to go all the way to the bottom. And corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. You can click on these little eyes. This will explain, give you the words for it, you know, so that you can actually see that. All right, the proof is complete. You can click check. And I think, did I not click it? There we go. Um, so yay, we finished that one. So that's the end of chapter six. Um, I believe we will be working in chapter seven before the end of the semester here. Oh, nope, I'm fibbing you. There's one more section for chapter six. There's, we're going to start looking at some of the distance formula and stuff like that. So I will see you in section six.